I should go back and ask again, so who all knows me? And then I'd like to take names, you know. <laughs> this is great. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity that was presented uh, to me through, um, can you still hear me? It feels oh. like it dropped off. Okay, all right. Um, I'm actually not used to using microphones, but I also don't typically talk to rooms this large because it seems like most of my seminars are at a garden clubs in like living rooms. <laughs> So, uh, which is cool because they usually have really good homemade food, so. Um, so, I am with the St. Louis Audubon Society. Um, we do have this thing called Bring Conservation Home, which I will talk a little bit about at the very end of our discussion tonight. Um, but Audubon is birds. I mean, if you like, you know, you're certain age, whatever, I'm mean, sort of a stereotype, you know. I actually thought about bringing my binoculars tonight. Um, I actually wanted to walk in with the binoculars on me because that would just reinforce the stereotype. Um, you know, people looking and peering up, you know, or out or wherever, so. Um, but it's kind of interesting, right? You know, um, the songbird tree connection. So it's like birds and trees. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, do you need a seminar for this, you know? So, so seriously, um, we'll uh, cover hopefully a number of different subjects tonight, all related to that uh, umbrella topic, um, some of which maybe you know. Uh, hopefully I can inform you on some of the topics you're already familiar with, and then perhaps maybe it's some new concepts as well. Um, as I think was mentioned as you came in the door, um, uh, in addition to the wonderful food out back, and I wasn't aware, and so I actually ate dinner before I came, so. So that's, a, that's another issue, but, but I brought a whole table of materials. Um, handouts are pretty obvious, um, but I also brought a number of reference books um, that you might just sort of take a look at, um, should you want to know more. Uh, and again, hopefully we'll have enough time and I'll, I'll do this properly and we'll be able to talk about resources and other ways to get additional help when we get toward the end. So, make sure our remote works too. Uh oh. It is on. There we go. <laughs> so, so what did the bird say, right? You know. Um, so uh, this is not a bird identification class, uh, and and yet at the same time, uh, probably every bird I throw up, uh, I will on the screen. I will, um, you know, just throw it out there and see, uh, see who knows uh, what we're looking at. Um, so anybody? Tough to tip mouse. Yeah, and so, so very polite, raising her hand, you know. <laughs> yeah, just shout it out, so. So uh, yeah, tough to tip mouse, so um, this is actually on my screen door uh, on the patio, so every once in a while you get really lucky, so. Um, maybe I have to point here. Um, I heard Vireo, Carolina Wren, Carolina Wren. We have several Wrens, several Wrens that are common around the suburban areas. Um, this may be one of the most common. Um, uh, this one, quick little story. Um, so this one actually was, uh, it, it's sitting on, on a roof. Um, that's actually the roof to its bird nest. It actually had shingles on its birdhouse. Um, obviously it didn't build it. This was a dog house. This was the neighbor's dog house with a skylight. An abandoned dog house that was not being used. Um, and uh, it got cracked in the skylight, so the wren found a home. Um, oops. Um, so, so this helps remind me to say to you that um, when you start looking at birds, when you start thinking about the ecology, when you start um, perhaps Again, if you're uh, able to do so, have the right space for it, you know, uh, have a place of your own or a little plot of, of, of land or, you know, at school or wherever, um, you start creating, uh, you know, the habitat and the system for the birds, it, it, it's, it so quickly moves beyond just seeing a titmouse or seeing a Carolina wren. Uh, it becomes wanting to see them grow, wanting to see them in life, want to see all the different stages and different aspects of nature and ecology that you can possibly get your hands on. Um, who has had the good fortune of having a bird nest near you? 
I mean, that's, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's just an extremely special experience. So, um, everybody know what this bird is on the right? <laughs> Anybody willing to admit not knowing what this bird is on the right? <laughs> Um, this is actually not the best photo. We'll have another one later, and then I'll really slam it to you. So, so Robin. American Robin. Um, it's actually preparing a new garden bed here. Um, and I don't know how well you can see this, but um, there's got to be four or five different grubs and worms that it has in its bill. Um, I mean, we've all seen robins, likely. We've seen robins around in the yard, you know, pulling worms out. But to actually see, you know, it's like, hey, I'm gonna keep getting more, keep getting more, because there's more than one kid back in the nest. <laughs> because that's likely the deal. There's probably several that were in the nest in my neighbor's tree. Speaking of biology and, you know, ecology and growth and development. So you actually saw a baby cardinal in that earlier slide. So this is a baby, anybody? It's not the easiest, this is a brown thrasher. It's not terribly common. Um, I hear them more than I see them. Um, but we know this is a young bird. We call it a fledgling. Fledgling is after they leave the nest, but they're still young and immature and not standing on their own, so to speak. Um, a nestling would be stuck in the nest and not very many feathers and totally dependent upon the parents feeding them. But it's not fully developed, and we know that if you just look at the wings and the tail, uh, I mean, they're short, they're kind of stubby, maybe thin, so uh, it's still waiting for parents to feed it. Whoa! How did that happen? It's like it caught up with me. Now you know the rest of the slides. Uh, any guesses? I heard scarlet tanager, then I heard summer tanager. Yes, it is the summer tanager. So the scarlet tanager actually has black on it. The only all orange bird we have is the summer tanager. One of the reasons I like to include this bird, first of all, every bird that I'm showing you, I've either seen in my yard, I might have taken the photo, it's been around my neighborhood. I consider all of these birds gettable, suburban, backyard sort of birds, okay? part of the message for today. So I have actually seen a summer tanager in my yard. I got a photo. Nobody would know it was a summer tanager except me. Um, so I had to borrow Al Smith's photo. But another thing that's really cool about them, and I actually saw this. I took that poor quality photo, but I actually watched this happening. I think that's, I think the behavior is what actually allowed me to see the bird. Because something strange was going on by my asters in a September day a few years ago. And I watched long enough to see a, um, uh, a, a, a tanager that was migrating south and it was trying to catch bees that were pollinating my asters, that were visiting my aster flowers. And that's one of the things that's known for the tanagers. They are rather weird birds. They will actually pursue and eat stinging insects. Um, and they actually know how to wipe the stinger off on branches. So, so very cool critters. Um, barred owl. So, barred owl, absolutely. So we have just three that are commonly found around St. Louis. The great horned and the screech owl would be the other two. We'll see a photo of the screech owl later. Um, this is not terribly common. The great horned is probably most numerous. I hear the great horn nearly every year uh, in the winter at my house. I have heard the barred owl at least a couple times. Uh, I don't know how close they are. I don't hear them very frequently. Um, but uh, because that's another one of the things that I'd hope to inspire you or maybe you're already thinking about or you're already passionate about when I talk about ecology and life cycle and all the different you know, activities that you can see in nature. Predators and prey, right? I mean, nature red in tooth and claw. I mean, actually, you know, being witness to and seeing, not because you're necessarily like, you know, got a problem with the thing that they're eating, okay? Um, but just to see that whole process. And especially if it's something that's going on in your own landscape or in your own neighborhood, how cool is that? You know, you don't have to go to the wildlife refuge. You don't have to go to the state park in order to see those sorts of things. And, and so, this one? Hawk. 
Uh, Peregrine is not a bad guess. Um, it, it, it is a Cooper's hawk. It is a Cooper's hawk. Um, and so a couple things on this. First of all, uh, just a follow up to that whole, you know, raptor, hawks, eagles, owls, right? Birds that eat other animals. So we had the owl, so now you got a hawk. But the other thing, and this is about the most common carnivore you're gonna see in your neighborhood. It's the most common raptor, the most common meat-eating bird you're going to see in your neighborhood, the Cooper's hawk. But also, this is the same species. This is the same species. Because one's, this is the juvenile, and this is the adult. So just, again, one more thing that you can look for, that you can experience, that you can appreciate with birds. But just, I mean, look at all the, I mean, totally different pattern here, vertical, this is horizontal. We've got, you know, striping on the head. We've got this gray helmet. Look at the eyes. The eyes are different colors. Juvenile versus adult. So just some really, really cool things going on here. So. How big is that well, adult? How, how big is an adult? So, so our Cooper's hawks are maybe, you know, 15 inches haul, uh, high, uh, tall. These are not, uh, maybe like crow size, right? So, you know, you see crows around town, so the Cooper's hawk is of a similar size. So the great horned owl is going to be bigger than this, the red-tailed hawk is going to be bigger than this. Would, would you guess, give a guess on a, a gray hawk that's bigger than that? Uh, All the external feathers are gray? Yeah, so, so the most common raptor around town that's going to be roughly all gray, uh, which we, we do have uh, uh, during the breeding season, is a Mississippi kite. Um, I actually have several field guides over here that y'all might take a look at, but uh, the Mississippi kite is becoming more and more numerous around here, uh, and that would be a real good possibility if you're looking at a, a bird somewhat larger than that, and that was nearly all gray. Very cool bird in the alley in the city. They, they have adapted to humans in Mississippi kites. The, actually, they nest in uh, Carondelet Park. They nest in Kirkwood. Uh, yep, I've seen them in very dense urban spaces. Yeah, I know Mississippi kite makes you think that like they're out along a river or something, but, but uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty suburbanized. They eat a lot of insects, um, as it turns out. So, so as we um, move into ecology, okay, and, and get some of the science lessons for tonight, um, it's, uh, I think it's very important that when we have these opportunities to talk about our ecology, to talk about the science, to talk about the nature in our midst, that we're clear about the challenges that we have. Um, and, and it's a big deal. Um, Broadly speaking, so this is not bird specific, okay? So just hit a few highlights about our environment. This is not bird specific data at this point. I mean, Missouri was a prairie state and there's just fragments, just pieces left uh, of our prairie and our wetlands have been, you know, filled and they've made shopping malls and subdivisions and, um, You know, and, and what, what, is, what does this mean? Well, um, we have, uh, when you add up all the little snippets of, you know, front yard, backyard, when you add them all up, we have more lawn in the United States than we have the state of Missouri. I mean, if you add up all the little pieces, it, it's more than the state of Missouri. You could fill the state and then some with all of the lawn pieces. And, you know, it's not because lawn is bad in and of itself, but it's because, well, you probably know, lawn doesn't do a whole lot for habitat. So, we don't frequently talk openly about invasive species. Um, bush honeysuckle was mentioned on the intro, and I do have a handout for it. Fortunately, because of that plant, we actually do talk about invasive plants in the St. Louis region. So many of you sitting here tonight may be aware of this subject of invasive species, uh, not just plants, but that's certainly uh, a, a key concern. You know, stormwater runoff, water quality, right? You know, pollutants coming off of our developed spaces, you know, and, and how much
So you add up all the paved surfaces, and that, I mean, if 60,000 square miles is slightly larger than the state of Missouri, then clearly our paved surfaces are almost as large. Now, a little bird specific here at the end, things that, again, maybe you've not thought of, maybe you've not had any opportunity to experience. Um, the uh, cat comment, so I'm not here to you know, lay judgment against cats or cat owners. I actually had a cat for 16 years and I loved her to death. Um, but she was indoors. I would let her outside supervised. And she didn't let, I didn't let her wander unsupervised because I like my cat and I like my birds and they don't play well together. <laughs> simple fact, simple fact. Um, on the window side, anybody who has spent any amount of time in a single family home has likely had the experience of either seeing or hearing a bird hitting a window. I know I did when I was a kid in Michigan, and I know it's happened at my house in Maryland Heights. Fortunately, it doesn't happen to every window. Fortunately, it's typically just one or, one or a couple problem windows, and, and there are solutions. There are very simple solutions to it. Um, and, and when you add it all up, when you add it all up, one calculation says that less than a fifth of the terrestrial surface of the planet is, quote, natural, right? The national parks, the national forests, you know, the mountainscapes, you know. I mean, less than a fifth we've not dramatically altered. That's, that's pretty powerful stuff. I'm not trying to depress you, okay? I may be doing that, but that's not the goal, right? Just making sure that we have context here. And, you know, I could, we could do entire workshops on, on climate change, right? I'm not an expert by any means, okay? But the average temperatures are increasing. We've got decades of data that have been collated that show without much doubt whatsoever that we've got something like 60% of birds that have been studied. They're wintering populations across North America. 60% of them have moved their winter ranges in response to changes in climate. They have moved inland from the coastlines. They have moved north. I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty sobering. You know, how big of a concern do we have down the road? Because we've taken that same data, the Audubon scientists and their partners, have modeled and looked at the climate studies and said, well, what might happen? So if over the last 400 years, nine bird species have been recorded going extinct, okay? The dodo, the Carolina parakeet, you know, uh, you, you've passenger pigeon. I mean, you've likely heard about a number of these. Well, the risk is over half of the birds that they're looking at in modeling in the future, over half of them are at risk. Are at risk of, if not extinction, then serious population declines, becoming threatened as a direct result of changes in the climate that they cannot respond to. And think about it in, again, I'm a bird person, right? Audubon, bird person. So we're, we're, we're talking all about birds tonight. But think about the broader ecology and recognize that birds can move. Birds can move their winter ranges. They can fly inland, okay? They have wings, they can be mobile. They can search for the appropriate food and resources in another place. The problem and what this is highlighting is they may not find it. They may not find the suitable conditions when they have to move because of the climate changes. But think about all the other critters. Think about all the other pieces of our environment, you know? How quickly can a reptile or an amphibian move to respond to climate change variables? You know, how does a plant respond to climate change variables? So, I know I said I'm not trying to depress you, but um, we're about done with this. So, so, all right, let's get into the birds, the trees, the connection here. So, in our average suburban yard, without doing really much at all, except maybe some bird feeders. We're talking about maybe two or three dozen different bird species, okay? They'll keep you interested, you know, especially if you get some, you know, activity going on, you got nesting nearby, you know, 
Um, you can be happy. I mean, it could be pretty interesting. By the way, this is that better photo, right? So, again, last chance. Anybody willing to admit you don't know this is the, okay. Call it Redbird, that's fine with me. Um, it is officially the Northern Cardinal. That is its official scientific name. Um, it is a male, thank you, yes. Um, some of us, and I, I don't say this for any reason other than it's the truth, um, I actually think the female is prettier. Um, I'm not trying to get points, I'm just telling you. Um, so, um, what's this one? Morning dove. Morning dove. And you ever notice the pink feet? I mean, you know, this bird is easy to ignore because it's so numerous and so abundant you might consider its cooing a little annoying and a little incessant after a while, okay? But again, back to that thing of just looking a little deeper, just paying a little closer attention. Pink feet on a backyard bird, go figure, okay? And how about this little guy? St. Louis Sparrow. St. Louis Sparrow. Okay, thank you for saying that again, because I didn't hear it at first. Um, okay, so the scientific name would not be St. Louis Sparrow, but that is a perfectly fine because it is the Eurasian tree sparrow. It was introduced um, and it hasn't really spread a lot beyond our region. It, it is found in Columbia, it is found in southern Iowa, but it's still pretty much uh, located here just in this part of the region. St. Louis being the biggest city <laughs> in its range, so we do continue to get phone calls, people coming out on a business trip going, hey, can I see the Eurasian tree sparrow? Where can I go to see it? And I try not to say my backyard any day of the year. Um, so, so a few dozen, okay. So setting a foundation, setting expectation here, a few dozen. So I call these potential backyard birds because it doesn't take a serious amount of effort, but a recognition of what birds need and one can create a space, a suburban space, a not huge giant refuge sort of parky space um, and get three or four times that many birds, okay? One homeowner in Kirkwood with a wooded lot, been working on bird ecology and what birds need for maybe 10, 15 years and she's recorded about 120 different bird species in her landscape, in her suburban North Kirkwood landscape, okay? I do not have a bird list for my yard, um, which is kind of crazy. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't admit to that. Um, I don't think any of my board members are here tonight. Um, uh, I, every once in a while I'll scribble all the birds down because I'm just bored for a few minutes, but, but I, I probably record, I don't have any big trees. So, so I'm here talking about songbird tree connection, but the city cut down my two big trees a couple years ago. Um, but uh, I've probably got somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 bird species that I've recorded, maybe a little more, I'm not sure. But, but again, the potential, okay? So, by the way, uh, what do we got here? Smarty pants, smarty pants, okay, all right. We're gonna test you though, all right, how about this one? I'm gonna guess that's the white-breasted nuthatch young. So we have a nuthatch guess, anybody else? Junko. Junko. So it looks like a flycatcher. Um, so long, thin bill. So it is in the flycatcher family. In fact, it's actually our smallest flycatcher. It's the blue-gray gnat catcher. Um, and uh, um, obviously not a typical pose here, okay, right? Photographer got lucky. So uh, here are a few guesses. There's actually a warbler. Vireo is not a bad guess because vireos also have long, thin bills. Um, but this is a warbler, this is an American red start. Um, uh, I, I, see I don't have that bird list. I, I've actually been seeing dozens of these this spring in my yard, uh, which has been really great. Um, I did see one of these a few years ago fly through. So, so okay, fine, a few dozen, over a hundred. So how many birds in Missouri? How many different varieties of birds in Missouri? Anybody? What, what's, what's the big number? 500. 500. <laughs> I like you. I like that guess. I like that guess. 400. 400. Um, you know, give or take a few, but 400 is a good round number for the number of bird species seen across Missouri in any given year. Okay? Now, this is not the potential for your yard, for your school, for your corporate grounds, for your church, for your common grounds. Why? 
because this is all the birds across Missouri. I mean, don't expect to get a trumpeter swan in your backyard, okay? <laughs> don't expect, want it, but don't expect to get a bald eagle at your church, okay? You know, <laughs> overachiever up here. I had a bald eagle. Um, <laughs> um, gulls, ducks, right, shorebirds. I mean, this, this is the whole ball of wax, okay? And it turns out fully half of these birds, a good 200 species, they don't even stay here in the winter. They scoot, they migrate. What's that all about? A good 200 species migrate. Come on. You may have seen this sort of graphic. Okay? So these are the flyways across North America. So the scientists have come up with four of them, Pacific, Central, Mississippi, and the Atlantic. Not that the birds, like, are actually following highway signs, right? You know? Um, but they're roughly coincidence with broad geographical um, features, right? The Mississippi, the Atlantic, and the Pacific are the easiest ones to think about because you got coastlines, you got mountain ranges, you got big giant river systems like the Mississippi and the Missouri. Um, but like half of our bird species in Missouri are migrating, like, like far, like going to Central and South America in the fall to stay away from us in the winter. What's their problem? <laughs> Anybody? They can't find food. Food, absolutely. A lot of times I get comments or guesses about it gets cold, which is not a bad guess. Um, the, uh, the understanding we have is that they are migrating primarily driven by the need for food, but the cues they're using, right, what prompts them to get ready to migrate and then to leave, would include temperature, would include day length, photo period, okay? You know, so they have cues that might be obvious when we think about seasonality and getting out our winter coats. But I like to emphasize this because it isn't the temperature that drives them because I just love to point out the fact that there are chickadees, little tiny, there are chickadees that live in Canada year round if you're that small of a bird and you can winter, overwinter in Canada, it's got nothing to do with temperature, they're able to find food. They're adaptable, they're looking, crevices, cracks, caching food, you know, and then keeping their fuel going, keeping their blood boiling. Could you explain what photoperiod means? Yeah, so photoperiod is the, is the science technical term for day length. Okay. okay. So that the, the days are shortening as you move toward the, summer, the winter solstice. Okay, so they're looking for food. They're looking for food in these birds that don't stay here in the winter because we have birds, we have lots of birds that can't find food here in the winter. The chickadee might be able to hang out in Canada all winter long. We've got birds that stay here in St. Louis during the winter, clearly they can figure it out. But we have birds that have to go in search of insects, okay? Primary food, those warblers, those vireos, those flycatchers that we were talking about and showing photos of, they're all obligate insectivores. Technical term, they eat insects across their entire life cycle, okay? But we've got local birds, including that titmouse, upper right, which we see here year round, including those cardinals, which we see here year round, they eat insects during their life cycle as well. Any Surprising to anybody? Cardinals eating insects. I mean, you know, the ubiquitous black oil sunflower eater, right? Coming to the feeder. I mean, because the point is, the point is reproduction and development. Those seed feeders for the titmouse, for the cardinal are fine for the adults. But the young, the reproduction, the growth and development requires protein. There's just not much protein coming out in those seeds, okay? Let alone whether or not the babies could actually digest them. But it turns out, just like human children, right? They gotta build muscle and bone. Human children can't grow up on Coke and Pepsi. Ice cream, you know, I mean, might want to, can't do it. You know, gotta get protein 
got to actually have that to build the muscle and bones. Works for humans, works for birds. And now, we, we talk about songbirds, okay? The emphasis here is songbirds. We've showed a couple examples of these raptors, these carnivores, right? And they're eating protein too, right? The, but the, co the, the cooper's hawk, the owl, they're getting their protein from other animals, okay? Here at the small bird level, we're talking about small insects. Caterpillars, we focus on a lot. Caterpillars are what? Butterflies and moths. I mean, caterpillars are the young stage of butterflies and moths. So my favorite way to say this is, you know, it's not because they don't eat any other types of insects, but the caterpillars are very helpful and very numerous. And if you were a bird, which would you rather pursue? A June bug or a caterpillar? I got nothing against June bugs, but you gotta find and catch that June bug first, right? The June bug can fly away, so that costs energy, okay? Not to mention the fact that once you catch it, anybody stepped on a June bug? On purpose or otherwise, you don't have to admit it, you know? But, I mean, hard exoskeleton, right? Crunchy critter, okay? So imagine that's probably not gonna go down the gullet of a baby bird or not without some help by the adult. So now they're dismembering it, trying to take off the exoskeleton, whatever, okay? Um, caterpillars, not so much, you know? Soft, go straight down, okay? Once you get the pattern in your mind, you know, little brain, you know, bird, search pattern for particular caterpillars. They might have been camouflaged initially, but now I know what they look like. Yeah? So birds are the cause of the monarch disappearance? No. So the comment was, uh, question is, so are birds eating all the monarch caterpillars? Um, so um, in short, no. Okay. Um, the, the monarch problem uh, is, uh, <coughs> is complicated, but it involves habitat loss. Uh, it, in, in, in all ways. Uh, loss of habitat for their reproduction. Uh, milkweed uh, that used to be along the edges of our farms across the Great Plains. Uh, and, and while I'm not trying to badmouth farmers, but we went industrial and we went edge to edge. Uh, uh, so uh, farmers are able to, to not need the hedgerows and then go all the way up to the edge of the road. If you've driven through Iowa, you know, uh, Illinois, you know what I'm talking about. So loss of habitat there, loss of habitat on wintering grounds, you know, pesticides. I mean, there's all sorts of things that have gone into that. And then unfortunately, in, in very straightforward ecology and population biology, when you get into small numbers, small populations, then you can have a single weather event can have a big significant impact. And their wintering population is in such a small space in the mountains of Mexico that all they need is a bad winter storm. Uh, and you can lose like half the population uh, in that winter. So, so the monarchs have a host of issues that they're struggling against. Uh, the fact that birds eat some of the caterpillars uh, is, is pretty low on the scale of concern, especially when we know if we plant more milkweed um, and create the habitat space, um, that will more than compensate for any of the bird issues. So the, uh, the, the critters, the insects are pretty cool as well, right? So this is not an insect class, um, but uh, just had to include this photo. Um, and I actually can't even tell you what it is because I, I, I borrowed this from another presentation. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I've emphasized, emphasized this several times. So it's not just birds, right? There's all sorts of things that you can look for and you can be amazed by in small landscapes. So just to put an exclamation point on it here, so mentioned chickadees once or twice, the boreal chickadee up there in Canada. So chickadees need insects. So any guesses on how many caterpillars it takes to make a family of chickadees? Anybody? 10,000. What, what was that? 10,000. 10,000. It's a pretty good guess, actually. It's actually a very good guess. Um, because it is thousands, you know, six, seven, eight thousand for a single family of chickadees, okay? But so many of you raised your hands when I asked about having seen 
a bird family, a bird nest, right, going on in your landscape or your home or somewhere near you, okay? So you know what this is about. You've seen this happen. You've seen the dawn to dusk feeding, right? You know, mom, dad, male, female, here they come, feed the babies. I mean, you know, all due respect to soccer moms, all due respect to aunts, uncles, grandparents, right? Shuttling kids to and fro, you know, this event, that event, you know, band. I mean, yeah, it's, it's stressful. It's, it, boy, it's tough. You have no idea what it's like. You have no idea what it's like. Watch a bird family watch a bird family and then get exhausted just by seeing them in action. Um, so this adds up. I mean, you can, literally it adds up very quickly. So, so uh, this is one of the most like actual particular parts of our science lessons tonight. So, so we made the case for insects are needed to support the birds. Now we gotta make that connection with the trees, in this case, the native plants, okay? It's not just trees, but it's all native plants because, in fact, it comes down to specialization over what one needs in order to get past the chemical defenses of a plant, okay? I already talked about the fact that we've got so many critters, that June bug, right? That June bug can fly away, okay? It can try to escape predation. You know, the birds at the feeders can fly away and try to escape from the cooper's hawk that may want to eat them, right? The rabbit can run away or hide from the owl or the hawk that wants to eat them. What does a plant do? A, a plant can't escape, so plants have chemical defenses, okay? They can't run away, they can't walk away, but plant-eating insects want to consume them, so over eons, millennia, eons of time, they develop chemical defenses in their tissues, and so it simply drives specialization. So you have a huge majority of plant-eating insects that are specialized in order to consume and get past the defenses of a particular group, <coughs> genus, small number of plants. Generalization is actually quite rare in plant-eating insects. Who knows what a Japanese beetle is? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, so that's a perfect example of a plant-eating generalist. The scientists have recorded several hundred different types of plants that the Japanese beetle has been found eating in like unrelated plants. I mean, not just like a big category of all sorts of related, but totally unrelated plants, three to four hundred different species. That's an exception. I mean, that's an exception. It's non-native, and we could talk about Japanese beetles later, but, but um, so specialization drives the train, and if you fill your landscape, again, church, common ground, home, you know, library, you know, if you fill it with non-native plants as we have, the insects don't have a space. They do not have food. So the insects are not there, the birds are not there, okay? They're making a case for native plants. So, um, I know a lot of you picked up the uh, handout with all the little numbers and stuff on it um, that was at the front door. So this is one of the slides that you have a copy of. So this, the numbers are how many different species of butterflies and moths have been seen feeding on that type of plant, okay? So if you look at your non-natives, now we say herbs, not to be confused, these are herbaceous plants. Herbs is short for herbaceous plants. So this is not just, you know, dill, parsley, garlic, oregano. I mean, this is herbaceous plants, okay? As opposed to woody plants, because that's the next slide, okay? Woody plants would be our trees and shrubs. So common, non-native herbaceous plants, you may recognize many of these, all right? And look at the numbers. We don't have caterpillars, we don't have our local insects, our plant-eating insects feeding on our non-native plants. Not a shocker, really, if you've got any of those plants, right? You ever seen a caterpillar eating a hosta? <laughs> I mean, you may have seen a deer, right? You may have seen a rabbit, you may have seen a slug. I mean, you know, it's not that things don't eat your hostas. Uh, maybe, I don't know, grandkids, do they eat <laughs> hostas? Oh, no, sorry. Um, um, but your caterpillars are not eating the hostas, okay? And that's the food source we're, we're looking at here and we're focusing on. Um, and then look at the natives, common, 
herbaceous native plants. Big giant numbers. Asters and goldenrods, violets. Violets, who's got neat and tidy lawns? You know, I mean, violets can be annoying, okay? But little did you know, little did you know, you got a whole group of butterflies, whole group of butterflies called fritillaries that feed on violets. Will lay their eggs and the caterpillars will feed on violets. If you've let your violets grow at any point in time, you've also likely seen pollinators visit the flowers of the violets, which is pretty cool. What does SPP mean? Oh, thank you. Um, so SPP is plural for species. Singular species would be SP and plural is SPP, species. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Our shorthands here. So this is the other slide you have. And so this brings us into our tree connection here, right? Okay, zeroing in and talking specifically about trees. So common non-native trees, woody plant, shrubs, and common natives. Now just make a quick point here in case anybody's concerned. 518 species on oak trees, okay? All of these numbers are accumulated, accumulated over the entire continent all different types of species in that genus of plants. So that does not mean that in your neighborhood, your pin oak or your shingle oak or your schumard oak or, your schumard oak or northern oak, schumard oak, schumard, that's hard to say, schumard oak. Um, your single oak tree does not have 500 different species feeding on it, okay? Maybe it's got a few dozen, all right? If it did have 500, I mean, then it would probably not be here anymore, but. This is collected numbers across the entire continent. So then the number, like at 518, means there are 518 species of insects that Could you explain that? I didn't understand. No, fine. So, so just to reiterate, so over 500 different species of butterfly moth caterpillars are being supported by oak trees across the continent. Okay? And again, you look at the various reflective, you know, dogwoods, State tree, flowering dogwood, you know, its genus, not specifically Cornus Florida, but its genus is supporting over a hundred different species of butterflies and moths. So that's pretty cool. So just, again, visually reinforcing the point here, you know, this is traditional gardening. You know, left side, non-natives, traditional gardening, you know, entire leaves, nothing eats them, low maintenance. This is what we've been after for generations. This was our standard. This is what we're looking for. And this is the natives, this is the ecology. Holes in leaves, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Showing the activity, showing the ecosystem. So just some cute photos. There's that cardinal again. We keep coming back to the cardinal. And yes, lo and behold, in case you hadn't bought it yet, Hummingbirds need insects too. Who does a hummingbird feeder? Sugar water feeder. Again, but think about it. You know, now that you're getting the information, it's like, well, yeah, never really thought about it, but I guess it probably would be pretty challenging for that hummingbird to take the sugar water back and dump that down the gullet of the baby hummingbirds. Not because it couldn't do that, but because again, that's Coke and Pepsi. I mean, how would the baby hummingbird develop? On pure carbs, because that's all the sugar water is. There may be some amino acids and proteins and some interesting stuff in flower nectar, but it's still not, flower nectar might be better than sugar water, but it's still not going to allow the babies to develop, okay? So, so the flower nectar, the sugar water, don't stop feeding, don't stop feeding. Good stuff for the adults. Keeps the adult fueled so they can go find the spider, the gnat, okay? And take the protein back and feed the babies. Okay. So that was all about insects. We already established the fact, and we know there's lots of birds. While we may have a couple hundred species that migrate, we've got plenty of birds that stay here in the winter. They manage to find food, right? Winter can be kind of harsh, but birds are around. So what are they looking for? What are they gonna eat? Besides your seed feeder, what are they gonna eat? Berries. Fruit, absolutely. Of course, you got handouts, so I, I won't give you too much credit for that. You got handouts. I almost forgot. So, 
I'm not going to dwell on these. I won't read these to you because I hate sitting in an audience and having a presenter read slides to me. Um, but simply put, there are different types of plants when it comes to fruit. All the fruit is not created equal. And it all comes down to when that fruit is available and sought after by the wildlife and the nutritional content of it. Okay. Now, honeysuckle was mentioned earlier. I mentioned it once. I will mention it again in the context of this fall fruit. Okay. Anybody who's got honeysuckle around their house or grew up with it or seen it for many years, you're like, well, it must be pretty good. The birds eat the fruit. I mean, it's feeding the birds. What's wrong with that? Come on. How do I want to? I can't, I can't get rid of my honeysuckle. Birds are eating the fruit. Well, they're eating the fruit because it's there. They're not eating the fruit because it's good for them. Okay? That fruit is ripe at the time that they need food. They need food to build fat to overwinter. Or they need food to build fat to migrate, right? And have the fat re reserves as they fly south. The honeysuckle fruit is nearly all carbs. The native fruit that is ready to be eaten at that time has a significant amount of fat in it. The fall fruit has higher fat content, okay? So a very significant difference there and one more reason why you want the native plants, yes? What would you recommend to, what you think the honeysuckle to transplant there? All sorts of options. Um, actually, many of the plants that I'm gonna highlight um, would be viable options. It comes down to the exact site conditions you have. Is it moist? Is it shady? Is it sunny? How big a plant do you want? Um, so, so we could talk more after. Um, we, our Bring Conservation Home program might also be of interest, but I'm not trying to sell that. Um, this is not a commercial. So, so we're going to hit on a few examples of each one of these types of fruit, okay? These seasonal available fruits. So I won't talk to every one of these, but I will hit several of these. And I actually forgot, did, did you get this? Yes. Okay, okay. I, I wasn't sure, I, I knew like the first three or four slides I sent out and I couldn't remember, so. So you have these and I will then give you some more details on many of these. So uh, if you have the space, uh, either personally or your common ground or your corporate campus or, or something a little bit larger, um, a, a decent sized backyard. Black cherry is a wonderful native wildlife tree. It's insanely cool. Um, Prunaceratina is the official scientific botanical name. Um, can't be mistaken for anything else if you use that Latin botanical name. Is that sure you eat? So, um, this is a great wildlife plant, not for you to eat. Um, I don't know that you would get sick. You probably wouldn't be happy. It certainly wouldn't be tasty. What um, you eat is that good for the birds? I'm sorry? The cherry that you plan to eat, is that good for birds? Um, so they would probably eat some of it, <laughs> but one of the biggest differences between the cultivated cherry that we eat versus this is size. This is a perfect size for the average songbird to take straight. Um, and at best, they're going to have to dismember the, the uh, cultivated cherries to try to eat it. And so they may not even go after it. Maybe just large birds, perhaps squirrels, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, the, the other point here is the prunus genus, the cherry genus. There is more than just this single species. Um, but I just I like to highlight this one. And well, I actually should have included a slide that showed the flowers. Um, because just imagine if every one of those little berries was a flower. Nice white flowers just hanging, just hanging racemes of white flowers in late spring. Really, really pretty. And they've got an awesome, an awesome alligator-like bark. It's a really dark, really cool bark as this tree <coughs> matures. So this is one of the first uh, and, and the honeysuckle replacement question, uh, again, which ones you choose is dependent upon your particular conditions, but I will highlight many of them that are, that are potential options. <coughs> and we have shrubby dogwoods. So flowering dogwood is the state tree, Cornus, Florida. Great plant, but it has several cousins that are all shrubby dogwoods. So they're smaller, they're multi-stemmed, um, they'll root sucker, 
they'll fill in a space. It's one of the advantages for a honeysuckle replacement is a plant that root suckers and takes up a lot of root zone. Um, rough leaf dogwood, Cornus drummondii, uh, again, a great plant to create a hedgerow to, to fill in a space and naturalize. And you've got, again, fruits for the birds. Service berry, who, who's, who's eaten service berry, June berries? Just one, that's it? Oh my gosh. Come on, Bob, and you've eaten service berries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of my groupies over there, so. Um, so so uh, this is a, a great complement uh, in size and shape and structure in a landscape to a flowering dogwood. So, so if, if, again, if you're familiar with red butter dogwood, so this is a small tree. So uh, this is a very neat plant, wonderful white flowers, uh, and edible fruit. So unlike the black cherry, so this is a plant where you walk up to, as long as you get it before the birds do, early summer, <laughs> ripe, very tasty. How many years does it take before you start to uh, bloom? So one of the great things about our small <coughs> trees and our shrubs is you do get maturity a lot quicker than of course you would with a large tree. Um, I've got a chinkapin oak in my front yard that's several years old and it may be 20 years before it produces acorns. Um, but your small trees and your shrubs, it, it depends literally on the exact species and the growing conditions, but in some cases it might be just a few years, at most maybe five or six years. Um, but you're, you're looking at maturity quite quickly for, for most of these uh, uh, small trees even. So elderberry. Who's heard of elderberry? Yeah. One way or another. This is becoming really popular and many of you may know it not as a native shrub but you may know it as you know uh, a supplement as uh, you know, jams and jellies, you know, perhaps wine. I mean, it's getting a lot of attention for its beneficial, its nutritional value. Um, and it is a very neat plant. Uh, it's big, it's pretty bold, it spreads pretty easily, okay? So, so if you really like it, but if you have a small space, you might want to think twice, okay? <laughs> but if you have a larger space, if you have common ground, uh, it's a wonderful plant. I'll just put these up. Um, and speaking of wine, jellies, jams, and um, I, I actually stole this from another, uh, well, stole it from a friend of mine, so I don't know if you call it stealing, but, um, but flutes, I had, to, I had to look this up. I, th I thought that was a typo. I'm like, you know, fruits, you must mean fruits, you know. And it's like, no, there are people that actually will cut a stem of elderberry it's hollow inside, and they'll make a flute, a flute out of a elderberry, a musical flute. So, I don't know, put it on your list of weekend projects, you know. Um, so, that was summer fall fruits. Fall fruits, we'll hit on these. You have this slide, so I'll give you some particulars about each one of these plants. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, you're, yes, Chris. We're talking about Chris and the connection I have with Chris. So we're going to show a photo here uh, from Chris. So this is one of the most ornamental of native shrubs. Okay, ornamental in our image and our definition. Neat, tidy, you know, arcing stems. Um, uh, just a real, real cool green. I mean, this, you know, just just a really nice plant. And then the fruit comes on and it starts to mature in the fall and the leaves are still on, so you got the lime green leaves, you got these arcing stems, you got this magenta clusters of fruit up and down the stems. It's a really, really dramatic plant in your landscape. Quite adaptable. Um, we're talking maybe four feet, um, you know, tall and wide. It's not huge. Um, could be used as a foundation shrub uh, around houses or, or buildings. Does it need a lot of width, a lot of space? So it'd be about the same width, right? Okay. So it's four feet tall, maybe four feet wide. Um, can get larger, in my case, because I don't prune mine. I do as little yard maintenance as possible. I'm a lazy gardener. Um, but, uh, so speaking of Chris, so this is one of Chris's photos from her backyard. But one of the reasons I include this, by the way, what is this bird, anybody? Gray catbird, absolutely. 
gray cat bird. Very cool bird, and I see this bird for two or three weeks every fall in my backyard doing this. Sitting in my beautyberry shrubs eating the fruit. Now I don't, I don't have the camera that Chris does, uh, um, and, uh, and so I, I borrowed her photo. But, but that, that's, I see the gray catbirds in the fall. I don't see them any other time of the year. They do nest around the St. Louis region. They don't apparently nest near my house. Um, I don't see them in the spring. I don't see them over the winter. But reliably, I get to feed the gray catbirds migrating south in my yard with American Beautyberry that I put in the ground 14 years ago. That's a pretty cool thing to do. And you should know Chris lives in University City. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, I may be in Maryland Heights, which is, you know, suburban. It's not a big lot. Um, but yeah, she's actually right on the edge of the city. Um, it's right near Forest Park. Um, but um, uh, Mockingbird, Northern Mockingbird. Many of you may know that. I was supposed to let you guess, sorry. Same shrub, same activity. I don't see these a lot. I see them a little bit more often than the gray catbird, but. So obviously you've picked up on, so we call this the songbird tree connection, but it's the songbird woody plant connection, right? I mean, uh, we are highlighting a bunch of trees, but we're also including shrubs and small trees. So black gum, not to be confused with sweet gum. This is a nice shade tree, okay? So again, you're talking about longer time period for it to mature, but quite adaptable, not to be confused with sweet gum. Now, folks, sweet gum is a native tree, okay? It belongs here, all right? Um, <laughs> I, I understand the frustrations and, and I would sympathize. Uh, uh, I had a sweet gum in my front yard before the city cut it down. Um, and uh, I just uh, was blessed with the fact that my wife is a neat and tidy person and loved to be out there and pick up every single sweet gum ball. Um, and that, she wanted to, I didn't force her, I didn't make her do it. Um, but uh, very neat tree. Um, speaking of flowering dogwood, mentioned it several times. Uh, great plant, fruit producer. Uh, we saw the numbers about the insect support, right? It is the state tree, so rah rah, you know. <laughs> Sassafras, this is another one of those plants, sort of like the black cherry. I don't know that I'd put it in a small space. Um, if you've got a larger spot, common ground, you know, larger property, uh, perfect. And I, I say that because this plant wants to be a grove, it wants to be a cluster. It doesn't want to be a single tree. Um, that's again a good thing when you've got the space and they're wonderful plants. Um, and I think it's, is it the giant swallowtail? The, the host? I know, I'm looking at Bob and Ann again. Spice bush. Spice bush, it's an alternate, okay, all right. A little, little behind baseball there, inside baseball, sorry. Um, but I mean, look at the fruit. The, the, the challenge here, of course, is it, it's a shade tree. So I actually don't know how easy it is to ever see the fruit, right? As it matures and now, right, branches up here. And so, you know, um, somebody got the photo. Speaking of spice bush, so here's another potential candidate to help replace your bush honeysuckle. Um, again, depending upon the site conditions. Um, uh, real neat plant. If you've got deer around, Many of you may have deer around, okay? You may know the challenges of finding plants that maybe they don't eat or creating some exclosure device or putting out the right repellent or you know, just saying boo often enough, I don't know. Um, but spice bush is one of a few plants that they just really don't seem to care for. Uh, and one of the reasons I know that with good confidence is there's uh, more than our share of deer at Creve Corps Park. And I spend a lot of time working at Creve Corps Park, honeysuckle removal and things. And the, the bluffs in particular at Creve Corps Park are filled with pawpaw and spice bush. The deer have eaten almost everything else. Is it a bush or a tree? This is a bush. This, this is a shrub. Yep. So depending upon ha how happy it is, um, could be six feet, could be eight or ten feet. Um, but you can also prune it. Um, and you prune at the right time of the year and, and should be good. So, so spice bush is in the wild known as a understory shade uh, shrub, but like many of our plants that do grow in the woodlands, they will 
be happy with a certain amount of sun, but most of those woodland plants don't want full sun or afternoon sun. So last group of, of trees here, and then we'll move on to a few other subjects uh, before we wrap up. So a few examples of the winter fruits. And again, I think you have this list. So um, Deirdre, do you recognize this photo? Yes, I do. Maybe you recognize the plant. So um, uh, I knew of this plant. I didn't actually become a fan until I saw it at Deirdre Gallagher's house last fall for our native plant garden tour. Hmm? I have it because you told me to plant it. Well, I know. So, but, but recommending something and being a fan, that's two different things. So, so um, because while I may have several dozen species, uh, maybe 60, 70 different species of plants at my house, that's just a fraction of what's commercially available. And so you get into a situation where you talk to a landowner and you're making ideas and recommendations about how to improve the space for habitat. Well, I can't possibly only recommend the plants I have. So, so this is a case where I was regularly recommending this plant, but I didn't have personal experience with it. When I saw it at your house, I'm just like, that is so cool. I've seen it in the wild. To be fair, I've seen it in the wild. I liked it in the wild, but you know, seeing it in a going to happen. Colorado blue spruce, that's the official name for that plant. They've been happy here for a long time, but we will start to lose more and more of them. So this is, this is the most adaptable, this is the most versatile of almost any evergreen plant you're going to see. Um, and uh, they're, they're really cool wildlife plants. Um, now again, I wouldn't necessarily put it in any given space. Um, but especially where you've got a naturalized opportunity, you've got a larger spot, um, or you just want an evergreen and, and you know, maybe just keep a single one because they're really neat plants when they're by themselves and they have plenty of room to grow. They're, I think they're really, really neat. They're like, just really cool. Do you need the male and female? So you do not need the male and female as far as you know, the plant's gonna live long if it's just a male or just a female, but the full reproduction is only provided when you have both in the area. Um, and, and then that's the blue fleshy cones on the female. Um, we put this under berries, right, under fruit. They're actually fleshy cones, um, technically, um, but the birds pursue them and eat them just as if they were berries, so. And that is another cedar waxwing. So hackberry, very cool, very adaptable native tree, another shade tree. That's the fruit early in the season. Again, it ripens over the winter. Winterberry holly. So American holly would be the second of the evergreen trees that I mentioned here, native evergreen trees. So, so eastern red cedar, American holly, but that's a large tree. So this is a small shrub. So winterberry holly, deciduous, actually loses its leaves, but very cool with the fruit. Depending upon your site conditions, this would also be a viable replacement for the bush honeysuckle. Persimmon, who's, speaking of edible, so who's eaten persimmons? I mean, anyway, right? Straight or in a recipe or what have you. Uh, uh, many of us know a, a guy uh, um, who's recently retired, but uh, he still gets around town life as a master naturalist. He makes persimmon pudding bars. Um, persimmon pudding bars, they're really, really cool. Um, but uh, again, great plant if you have the space for it. Viburnums, one of our last plants here. Um, viburnums, 
Many folks know the non-native viburnums, the leather leaf, the double file, the Korean spice. Um, those are fine, but those are not native. These are, we have several commercially available native viburnums, uh, widely adaptable, great plants. Yeah. So the ones that aren't native, are they still good for the critters that are so, so my understanding is most of the non-natives do have flowers and fruit, okay? So you would be sort of supporting the pollinators that visit the flowers. You might be supporting the birds eat the fruit. There's some concern, um, I think it's leather leaf. There's one of the, the, the non-native viburnums that there's been some observations of maybe it's starting to spread uh, into you know, uh, the wild. Uh, I haven't heard a lot about that. Um, I don't know about the, the insects. I do not know whether the insects are still able to eat the leaves of the non-native viburnum. So that would be a question. What are some of the names of the other native viburnums? Yeah, so um, there is a blackhaw viburnum. There is a rusty blackhaw viburnum. So these are common names. Uh, and there's a nannyberry viburnum. Uh, and then uh, this is probably one of the most uh, um, uh, popular native viburnums in the nurseries. Eastern red cedar. So, so now says shelter. Okay, so now we're done with food. <sighs> we're done with food. <coughs> so birds and trees make the connection. So we want to leave you here, the last section of what else do birds need or get out of trees. So all that food stuff, obviously critically important, but now we wanna to touch on a couple other points. So you need shelter, right? Part of habitat needs, shelter from the storm, shelter from the elements. So we talked about native trees, again, evergreens. We've got all sorts of evergreens in our landscape, right? The boxwoods, the arborvitaes, the yews, I mean, all sorts of non-native evergreen trees. Well, the birds evolved in this part of the continent without evergreens for their shelter. They found it in mixed hedges and mixed shrub rows, okay? And even in the winter, sorry for the out of focus here, even in the winter, a dense hedgerow mixed species of native shrubs and small trees is going to provide shelter. Okay? Throw in some grasses because don't forget even the non-woody plants, even the non-woody plants left through the winter are going to provide a significant amount of shelter for the critters. Critters, not just birds, because some of those same caterpillars are overwintering in some of this vegetation. Okay? We can all agree that's not shelter, right? These are not the same spaces, but this is, this is a perennial flower garden bed. This is a perennial flower garden bed. This was left up all winter long. Leave it for the critters, leave it for shelter, leave it for seeds, leave it for the insects. This was fall cleanup. Nothing there all winter long. Critters gotta go elsewhere. So, last subject, and then our last few minutes, we'll talk about resources. We're gonna have time to talk about resources a little bit. So, food, different types of food, shelter, well, nesting, reproduction, right? Places to raise your young. So, you had photos of bald eagles. Um, <laughs> fact is, most of us are never gonna have a bald eagle nesting nearby, okay? let alone in your backyard. It's just not gonna happen, okay? But that's all right. Because you've got trees, you've got small trees, you've got shrubs, multi-stem shrubs, tiny branches, because it's the tiny branches that the tiny birds need. Okay? So, Build it, build it, then they will come. Build it, then they will come, okay? Now, we've also got, so, so, simply put, you have shrubs, trees, small trees, you're providing nesting opportunities for our birds, right? So another part of that songbird tree connection. We've got several dozen different native bird species 
that nest in cavities. <coughs> they don't build sticks, they don't get the moss and the lichen, they don't create a little structure that you can see in the winter in the tree or the shrub. They nest in cavities, well, somebody's got to create the cavity, right? Woodpeckers do that work, okay? But there are many bird species that, that then move into a woodpecker cavity after they've left. I, I mentioned earlier about the three owl species. I said we'd have a photo, so this is screech owl. So this is the eastern screech owl. This is the smallest of our regularly occurring local owls. This is not a woodpecker cavity, this is actually a natural cavity that the owl found. But, you know, th this is what the woodpeckers want to do. Now, first of all, let me be clear, you know, woodpeckers are not killing trees. Woodpeckers are taking advantage and hollowing out and looking for food and then creating nesting cavities in dead or dying limbs or trees, okay? So, so the tree was infested by a wood boring insect, the tree died of old age, it was struck by lightning, something happened to the tree or the limb, and the woodpecker says, hey, cool, I can take advantage of this. We know this to be true because, you know, good, hard, you know, healthy tree, woodpecker slamming its head against it, that's just not fun, you know. But it makes a big difference if, if that wood has started to decay, if there's things going on inside that tree that makes the wood easier to excavate. The bottom line though is, this may be you know, worthwhile understanding, but a lot of us can't let this happen around our homes, around our buildings, right? I mean, once the limb is dying, once the tree is dead, you, know, you don't want it to fall in the house or the car or what have you. Um, so that's why we have birdhouses, okay? Birdhouses are cool, birdhouses are important. So, you know, the, when you can't leave, the, if you can leave this, if you can leave the wildlife tree up, please do. This is wildlife habitat, this is very important. But if it's gotta go, you know, look for a nest box, look for an opportunity to bring in the birdhouse. What's holding that up? I believe that's on a post, and, it, and it's just sort of in the outer limbs of, of the, the tree there. Okay, so I promised resources, so we'll wrap up with a few slides here um, and let you go on your way. So, um, birds, you want to know more about birds? You want to see more birds? You want to dig those binoculars out and admit to your true colors and be a bird watcher? You know? So, state parks, if you haven't been to Castlewood, to Babbler, to Quiver River, to Horseshoe Lake over in Illinois, I mean, we've got a wonderful array of state parks and you don't have to go very far to get to them. Um, who's been to West Alton, the Audubon Center at Riverlands? Okay, got a few of you need to go. So, um, very cool visitor center. This, by the way, is not the visitor center. Um, I actually tried to get a picture of the visitor center. I couldn't find one easily. This, but this is a bird blind, which is on site, uh, which is at the Riverlands property. Um, programs, bird walks. Speaking of bird walks, Forest Park and Tower Grove. There are regular bird walks at both of those parks. Tremendous, great opportunities to see wildlife uh, as well as the birds. So I mentioned the materials I have on the table over here, okay? That includes field guides, okay? You wanna learn more? Now, you can download the app, right? You can download multiple apps. Nothing wrong with that. But no matter how old you are, no matter how good you are with technology, odds are really good that you're gonna end up with a paper field guide. You're gonna end up with a book because there's just something else about it. It's not about having it in your hand, but it's just about the rest of the information that comes with it. So, so I brought the field guides. Uh, I didn't put my phone out to show you the bird apps. You can find those. Um, binoculars, uh, I could talk to you one-on-one -on -one if you want to know about binoculars. Uh, bird walks, I mentioned. Um, uh, we've been offering more and more beginner walks through our organization. Forest Park Forever has first Saturday beginner walks. We collaborate with them. You know where the visitor center is at Forest Park? Um, first Saturday of almost every month at about 8.15, they meet at the visitor center. It's a beginner bird walk, uh, co-led by us a lot of times. We actually have just initiated, we haven't signed the contract yet, but we're gonna start offering beginner bird walks on Great Rivers Greenway trails around St. Louis. Um, we've actually got one scheduled on the Al Foster Trail. Uh, many of you may know the Al Foster Trail, uh, not far from here. 
Uh, it's a Wednesday, the 25th of April. It's a rare weekday bird walk. Most of our walks are on Saturdays. Uh, all of that's on our website. So if you want help with creating the habitat, okay, so that was bird stuff, you know, right? Looking at birds, finding birds, you know, being out in the open. But if you want help with creating the habitat, replacements for honeysuckle, which tree to plant, which shrub to plant, what to get rid of, what's good, what's not, um, these are all great opportunities, and I have flyers and handouts over here about most of these. Um, I will highlight one before I talk very briefly about our Brink Conservation Home Program. Wild Ones is a regional garden club for native plant people. So it's a tremendous opportunity to socialize, to learn one-on-one -on -one of what individuals are doing in their landscapes. You can tour on a monthly basis, you can tour an individual landscape. You would meet at somebody's home in the Wild Ones group and actually walk around their space and learn very specifically about what they've done and how they've done it. Um, so very cool opportunity there. So shameless plug for our native plant garden tour, with, which is a collaborative with Wild Ones and the St. Louis Audubon Society. Um, tickets are on sale right now. I've got a flyer over here and some little bookmarks you can take with you. Um, but it's a great opportunity to tour 10 homes in one day on your own, self-guided, pick and choose which ones you want to go to, and again, see different examples of habitat creation, native plants. So my last comments here, Bring Conservation Home, that is our habitat consultation service. So the St. Louis Audubon Society's program to actually come to your home, to your landscape, to your school, to your church, to your common ground, to whatever it is, to your space for a small fee of as little as 25 or no more than $50 for the small residential landscapes. And we spend a couple hours with you. These are two habitat advisors flanking the homeowner. A couple hours with you in your landscape. Find out about your goals, your interests, your landscape, your particulars. Give you feedback and then share examples. But then we send you specific written recommendations on how to achieve those goals. This is an example of one of the reports that was sent out. So it's not a landscape design. That's not going to be $50 if it was a landscape design for your entire space. Um, but it does address the right plant, right place thought process. If you've done any gardening whatsoever, you know exactly what I mean when I say right plant, right place. Um, so it's a lot of plant lists throughout the report helping you understand what would work in each one of those spaces that you're interested in. So we, we don't do it by ourselves. Um, we've got lots of partners and supporters. Um, if you happen to live in Chesterfield, we have nine partner communities in this program. Chesterfield is one of them. What the partner community means is if you live in that community, then you get the service for the member rate of $25. Um, and that's an arrangement we have with those partner communities because they help us market the program, saves us marketing expenses, uh, and then we provide that little bit of benefit to the residents. So I hope you have been sold on my Kool-Aid here. You've been accepted the, the science, you've accepted the message in the ecology. Um, the birds need the trees, they need the native trees for everything that those trees can provide from the food to the shelter to the places to raise their young. Um, because no matter how old you are, we're all doing this because of the next generation, right? We're all doing this for the future because four years now I've had the good pleasure of getting up every morning and working for the good of the environment and trying to leave this place better than I found it. So thank you all for coming tonight.